I'd just like to introduce um, Marion Falker, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Committee of Perth. Uh, she's been in that role since 2007, and under her watch, the organisation has become a significant ab advocate for positive change and thinking, thinking differently on issues affecting the sustainable growth of our city and the Peel region. Future Fremantle is the first sub-region project for the Committee of Perth and was commissioned by a consortium of private sector and local bodies. Welcome, Marion. She's going to talk to us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Many of you were here in September last year when we promised we would do a thorough evaluation of Fremantle and tell you what your opportunities are for the future. And I hope at the end of this presentation you agree that we've done a good job. So what I'm planning to do is take you through a little bit of how did we get to here and then spend the majority of the time talking about the 14 findings which provide the basis for the opportunities for the future. And um, I'm very conscious that not every one of you will be able to see these slides in detail, so I will talk to them a little bit so that you can get some of the detail. And we will have this presentation and the matching audio up on our website within a couple of days and the Chamber is uh, welcome to circulate that to you all. I'll also say you will get a copy of the report on the way out. So I hope to present the information to you in quite a different way than the way that you'll read it in what is um, a fairly heavy duty report with lots of facts and figures. So here's the journey. Future Frio, uh, as Scott said, is a project uh, that was funded by many of the Fremantle stakeholders, including the two local government authorities uh, and the port as well. And we were very pleased to have such a good cross-sectoral view as we discussed some of the very contentious issues. Um, and there was this sense arising out of the city of Fremantle's visioning process a couple of years ago that should there be a committee for Fremantle, of which my blood went cold, here we are working really hard across the metropolitan region to think about Perth's future. And the worst thing for us would have been to have some sort of donut group form and think about Fremantle quite differently. So we were really um, happy to share our intellectual property, the way we go about doing what we do, and that allowed us to bring our relationship with UWA to bear as well. And um, I think it works very well. The way that we go about doing what we do is completely different to any of you asking a consultant to do a report. We actually start with what does the evidence tell us? Whereas if you're commissioning a consultant's report, you say, here's kind of where we think we'd like to be and can you find the evidence to tell us that? We actually do exactly the opposite. It does mean you are in free fall a bit because you never quite know what the evidence is going to tell you and you have to suck it up. So we have no editorial rights on what the evidence tells us, but we can then sit with the steering committee and do a very deep analysis of what does it mean for the future and that's what this report is about. So we started with a scoping exercise and what we wanted to do was document the social, economic and demographic character of the greater Fremantle region. So we're not just talking about the city, we're also including uh, the town of East, uh, East Fremantle as well. We wanted to know how does that Fremantle region fare against other counterpoints in metropolitan Perth. We wanted to benchmark Fremantle against other relevant cities and as you can imagine that would be port cities. And we wanted to document the strengths and weaknesses of Fremantle as a region. So that's what we set off to do. We found our project partners. The Committee for Perth Board was happy for us to undertake this first sub-regional project. But the thing that they wanted to see was some skin in the game. So the City of uh, Fremantle came on board straight away, matched with the Chamber of Commerce, and then the other funding partners came to bear. And it's very good to see such good private sector representation. And of course, every good project needs a fabulous uh, chair. And Adrian Finney is someone who knows and loves Fremantle intimately, so who better than to do, you know, to oversee the work than Adrian himself. So thank you, Adrian. And so here's our project steering committee, lots of faces that Fremantle people would know. Um, almost a gender balance, which is very important to Committee for Perth since we put out our gender report mid-year. And what we had there was a range of ages, views, perceptions on Fremantle, the reality of doing business or living in Fremantle. And at times the conversations got a little bit heated, but were always incredibly respectful. So project launched in this room in September last year. Uh, I think some people thought the jury would be out. What can you tell us about Fremantle? We don't already know ourselves. And uh, we brought our UWA researchers into the fold and 
convened by Matthew Tonks at UWA. So Matthew uh, and I have been working together since 2008 looking at various indicators for Perth. So it was fairly easy to extract uh, a meaningful set of data for Fremantle. And also our own manager of research and strategy, Gemma Davis, who's here for once because she actually lives in New Zealand. Um, she did the qualitative uh, data analysis as well. So. I think we've had a very rigorous approach to how we how did we draw the data in, and then, as I said, so many steering committee meetings along the way to actually analyse that. So one of the uh, sort of big insights a year into the project in September this year was to convene a town hall meeting, and that was free. It was hosted at the University of Notre Dame. Fremantle community was very welcome to attend, and we had about 110 people there from memory. And we sort of said, well, this is what the evidence is telling us. And we did both that from a qualitative and quantitative perspective. And then we had Chuck Wolf, who was visiting from Seattle, talk about urbanism without effort. And I think that really resonated in your community. Now, you always take a breath when you're going to do something like this in Fremantle. So we do the, do the forum. And we had one negative blog. So I think that that's a pretty good indication that we were on the right path and that allowed us then to get on with writing the final report, which is what we're launching today. So we've had four bulletins along the way uh, looking at different aspects of Fremantle and we've shared those widely. I have to say I am disappointed that the Fremantle Herald has not taken up the cudgel as best that they could have. Um, the West has actually been very good at uh, getting the information out more broadly and then the report that we've got today, purple in colour deliberately. So I'm going to share with you 14 findings and I'm going to tell you how we got there and then I think the richness of the discussion will happen when we get into the panel session. So Fremantle regional's, regional role has been diminishing over time. So if you think about Perth's growth and development as a metropolitan area and then including the Peel region, Fremantle's kind of stayed there and stagnated to some degree. So there's been the emergence of new regional centres, there's been new transport regimes, so think about the Mitchell Freeway and Kanana, Kanana Freeway extending north and south and then the heavy rail system going through that, so it made that sort of north-south transect much more easy to do. The shifting geography and urban investment, so as other centres have strengthened, they've attracted investment away from you. And because people could pretty much do whatever they wanted to do across Perth rather than just come to Fremantle or Perth City to shop and drink beer and all those other things, our fresco dine, um, that's been somewhat to Fremantle's detriment. So as I said, those things moving uh, in concert has meant that Fremantle's had a diminished position within the metropolitan area. And I actually think this is one thing you weren't attuned to as a community. So if you just look at the map of what was traditionally the Perth metropolitan area, the three big centres, Fremantle, Perth and Midland, and then over time a number of growing centres, Joondalup, Armidale and Rockingham, and then more getting added, and as Perth's linear development went on, 140 kilometres at the moment, you can just see that more and more centres have grown, and some people it would have been quite a big ask to ask them to come to Fremantle and spend the day or have a meal. So that's finding number one. Finding number two is a boom bypass, and I actually think for this, this has been both a blessing and a curse for you. So if you look at the Greater Fremantle population over time, since 1947, that's in the green line. You can feel, see it's fairly static. And Perth and Peel metropolitan area has just grown at an alarming rate. And another way of looking at these figures is your percentage of population over time. So starting in 1947, you were 10% of the region's population but in 2011, only 1.9%. So you can see why probably not a lot of political interest here compared to back in 1947. Finding number three is, I think, one of the greatest strengths that you can leverage into the future. So your ethnic diversity is critical to your identity and we also think to your locational advantage. So here are uh, a comparison of the people born overseas in your community. 1947 versus 2011, and you have doubled the amount of people, so that's that bit in red, doubled the amount of people who were born overseas. So you've pulled from the Anglosphere like the rest of Perth has, but what is really pleasing when you look at the breakup of your um, demography here, you've actually got this very high concentration of Italians and Portuguese and Croatians and others who have manifested the industries here and given it a very distinct and unique character. Finding number four 
the levels of wealth are fairly evenly distributed here. Um, and one of the things that has concerned us in our broader fact-based project is that in uh, greater metropolitan Perth, there is a sense of the growing divide between the have and the have-nots. And that's not something you've got too much of going on here. That said, however, one way we would measure that is to look at the new start and single parent payment. And you can see that uh, Fremantle has less than the uh, than the average of Perth and Peel, so that's a good indicator. But then when we look at housing, we think that that's one of the issues that you've basically got only a self-selecting group of people who can afford to live here. So let's look at the median house price over time. These are 2011 figures, Perth 490,000, going across the different parts of the Fremantle community, Inner Fremantle at 830, North Fremantle at 905, South Fremantle at 949, and East Fremantle at 1.1. So entry level into your property market is quite difficult, um, but obviously for those of you who live here, you're living in a great little enclave. So one of the pleasing things is that Fremantle actually has a greater diversity of housing than most of the metropolitan area, but you are still very much that single housing, uh, single family housing dominated. And so we're suggesting that there is a gap in your market of some high density living and the council's already gone about uh, zoning some land appropriately for that to happen. So here's just some few facts and figures and it's a very busy slide for you to have a look at. But the purple is basically uh, homes that are owned outright. The browny goldy colour in the middle is those on, with a mortgage and the green is renters. And you've had more people renting in the community more, lo uh, more recently uh, and more people paying off a home rather than owning their own home. And that's probably a reflection of the price of the property. When we have a look at uh, what types of housing you have, the purple is single dwelling family housing and the green, I think, is the other thing to draw your attention to, is people living alone. So this is why we really think that there's an opportunity for you to get some high-rise development around people who are living on their own and living in vertical communities rather than horizontal communities. Another pleasing thing is the um, dynamism of your economy here and there are a number of areas that perform particularly well. So when we look at where are your strengths, anything above one is good, and Fremantle's in the green, and Metropolitan Perth and Peel is in the yellow. So you can see that arts and recreation is performing better, health uh, care and social assistance is also performing better, transport and warehousing, accommodation and food services, and manufacturing. And another thing to look at in that graph is where you um, are really lagging behind Metropolitan Perth, and that's in mining, uh, insurance and financial services. So you've got quite a different mix of um, industry here. So there could be some barriers to your economy flourishing even more. And one of the things that we did was map where your strengths are, some of the things that you're performing particularly well in, some areas where you could perform better in. And I think that's a whole piece of work in itself, looking at what those barriers are. The future of retailing, I don't think I need to tell anyone who lives or works here locally that um, it's certainly uh, an industry on the decline, yet it is one of your largest employers. So that's you know, entry level jobs, casual workforce, um, you know, fairly low skilled work that is being picked up by the retail sector and if that continues to decline you're going to lose some of those jobs. So that's a, a word of caution from us. In terms of transport, we won't get into row eight here, that was going on while the project was going on. But, you know, your freight movements, your movements in terms of public transport, walkability, cycling, parking, they all came up as uh, part of the project. And it's clear that the issues are very divis uh, divisive in your community. So this sense of people saying, well, I'd actually like a more walkable place, um, and other people saying, well, I want to be able to park right outside the shop I want to go to and everything in between. So I think that's one of the areas where you're still incredibly divided about what it is that you want into the future. But with a very walkable uh, community, it's something you've got this great pattern on which you can build from. One of the comments that we would make though is that Fremantle's the end of the heavy rail line for commuters and there does need to be some public transport that pulls people south and east as well. Fremantle Port is vital to the West Australian economy, not just the local economy. And um, so whatever 
happens to the port into the future needs to be considered very carefully and obviously transition arrangements considered very carefully as well. And uh, Brad and I were talking on radio this morning about the future of the port and I did make the comment that I was born in Newcastle although I wasn't raised there. And the big difference between a place like that and Fremantle is that there was very heavy polluting industry going on there <coughs> and that's not the same as here. So yes, Newcastle's been incredibly gentrified and it's a lot better than it was in 1963 when I was born. But what's really sad is it's not a port city anymore. So that's something you really have to guard against. This is uh, some data that the port provided for us, just looking at container movements in and out. Obviously, we're very performing very well with imports at 94% of capacity, but there's some capacity there in exports in terms of only 61% of the containers were full. Changing pace a little bit from the economy and talking more about heritage and culture, one of your best assets really is this uh, heritage and culture, and we're not talking just about the buildings, but we're talking about Aboriginal heritage and the waves of migration that have happened as well. So we think they've been a bit underplayed in your story, and they're something that you could definitely leverage uh, into the future, and I know that the Noongar people would uh, really welcome that. Uh, one of the observations was that uh, so many people arrived in Australia through the Fremantle port, and they've made Perth and Western Australia and Australia their home, but it was that sort of first touch of land and how, how does that get recognised um, to people who don't quite know the story. And that's one thing about being a place for visitors as a destination is so that lots of stories are so almost self-evident to the visitor. Obviously the ethnic diversity that you've had is really driven that our fresco and cafe culture and, um, you know, like I said, because there's so many competitive offerings now across Perth and Peel, you've kind of lost your way a bit. And one of the things that the journalists liked from the West in the story this morning was, if you've got a high concentration of Italian restaurants, claim yourself as Little Italy because you've actually got a competitive offering. Now, I understand from a local resident's perspective, Kieran here said, but you can't get good Japanese. Um, <laughs> what the report says is, play to your strengths and address some of your weaknesses. Um, finding number 12 is really about um, being a tourist destination and you're attracting people probably for more day visits than you are for overnight. So if you look at the numbers for visitor nights, you can see Fremantle there in the teal and uh, Perth Inner in the red. So you can just see if you could just attract a few more of those people staying overnight, just how much more it would add to your economy and Perth would hardly feel the pinch. I think what's really interesting here is looking at the visitor origin. So intrastate is in the dark teal colour, interstate is red and then international is blue. And look at how many people are staying in Perth Inner but particularly Mandurah and Swan. So you could definitely try and attract from those regions as well. Number 13 is really talking about um, how many wonderful, intelligent, academically qualified people you have living and working in your community and how fortunate you are to have that. I know that my colleagues who run the committee for Geelong would love to have the intellect that's here in this room. In Geelong they've mainly got people who have got trades that are being replaced by automation, um, high polluting industries where those people are now in their 60s, unwilling to be retrained, staying in Geelong, poor and down at mouth. So, you know, you've got this great sort of creative knowledge force on which you can pull from. We've drawn out two sectors in the next uh, two findings, just so you can have a look at some of the profiles of the industries that operate here and the types of people that are in their workforce. So here are the number of people employed in education and training in Greater Fremantle, and you can see it's grown since 1991 to 2011. When we actually look at the profile of that workforce, the dark green is professionals. The next most significant group is the red, and that's community and um, personal services. So you can just see you've got this really high-end people coming and living and working in your community and how rich that is and how much leverage you could get out of it. And then we also took a little snapshot of and this was a bit cheeky, I'm sure Metropolitan Perth will feel a little bit offended by this, we looked at how many people are actually qualified in creative peels and parlayed you against uh, the metropolitan area. And as you can see on every indicator, you've actually got more, a percentage more here in Fremantle than they do. 
So society and culture, creative arts and natural and physical sciences, all high concentration, so you're doing particularly well. The final finding um, is looking at uh, another sector and we're looking at the healthcare and social services in this one. We're 1991 to 2011. You can just see very strong growth in terms of percentage change. And again, when we look at the people that are working in that industry, you've got professionals in the green and then red is community and personal services and blue is clerical and admin. So you can see once again a lot of people who are earning good money and uh, able to spend money in your communities. So the one thing in this finding is what is the future of Fremantle Hospital? What role will it play in the community into the future? And have you got some way of leveraging some health, uh, not only professionals, but some health infrastructure and maybe look at something, some sort of specialisation in aged care? So we will leave that with you, but uh, I just thought that was a really good analysis of looking at two sectors that employ a lot of people and you can just see how many professionals there are in there. So, where to from here? Formally launch the report today. Um, as I said, each of you will get a copy. It'll be widely available online and then obviously um, the takeouts from today as well. And there are so many opportunities for the future. So, we were very careful in this report not to have a report come down from on high with a series of recommendations. We felt it was best to leave the findings for you to digest. And then Adrian and I have challenged the steering committee that you have a series of forums around each of the opportunity areas and get a very long list of opportunities, short, medium and long term, so that you can start getting some action. And here are just, you know, we just did a little mind map of some of the opportunities here. So when we started this project, as I said to you, you never quite know where it's going to take you. And I was fearful that we were going to come back and report a whole lot of bad news and not too much good news. And actually, it's quite the opposite. You know, Fremantle is almost overburdened with opportunity, but it does take a bit of a change of mindset and a change of attitude. And I think the one salient point I want to leave with you is that you are operating in a broader metropolitan area that is fiercely competitive amongst the, sec the centres. And if you don't be attuned to that and think about how you can uh, leverage that to your advantage, you'll probably find that things e fall even further behind. We're not talking about a wholesale change to the character of Fremantle or even the face of Fremantle, but we are talking about some sort of fundamental attitudinal shift where you, d you do get attuned to this competitive nature because I can tell you that uh, when I go to meet with the local governments in Joondalup and Swan and others, they are all talking about what they're going to do to strengthen their regional offering. So on that note, here are the people that you're going to hold to account for bringing these forums to play. Um, so I don't think this is, and one of the things I do say, and even though I'm incredibly respectful of all the layers of government, you wouldn't want to leave government to make the future for you. All of you need to be involved in it as well. So when those forums happen, I really encourage you to go with an open mind and an open heart. And that's one of the things that I'm going to say to Perth metropolitan area. Reconnect with Fremantle in your hearts and minds. I think it's a place we've somewhat forgotten about. And so we need to make sure that we come back here. And before I started this project, I hadn't been to Fremantle for a year um, because I don't really need to. So I want to hear more about all the good things that you're doing. And um, there'll certainly be, um, I think, a lot of media follow-up. There was a lot of interest today from the media wanting to say, well, what next for Fremantle? And there was a lot of talk about, you know, is it going to take dollars? And yes, it is going to take some dollars, but it's also going to take... Um, private sector getting involved um, and all of you as a community being open to some degree of change. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Mary. That was, uh, that was great. Um, Roddy, I'd like to uh, welcome up for the panel um, Brad, our trusty mayor, uh, Brad Pettit, Adrian Finney, uh, chair of uh, Future Fremantle, uh, Matthew Tonts from the University of Western Australia, and Ras Stewart, who has been involved in the project, past president, the immediate past president of the Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Um, I think we'll have a couple of microphones floating about. Victoria is around, so this is a, a Q and A session. So uh, if you would like to stick your hand up, if you've got a question. 
Will you just down here first? <clears throat> um, Michael <laughs> McPhail, Deputy Mayor of East Fremantle. Um, I love the analogy of the mindset change as being one of the most important things that can come from this. Um, and I guess from that, one of the areas, one of the, the historical events that is always compared to where Fremantle is now within the past is um, the America's Cup. Um, and so my question is, what is the value of, ha of having that really what was an Olympics for Fremantle, an Olympics which can never be reached again in, in the way that many cities can never return to their Olympics. What is the value of having the America's Cup as a comparison point? Um, and what do you think we should be shifting to in our mindset? Am I going to go with that one? All right. uh, it's, it's, it's a good question because it's funny, all the media we did today kind of talked about that, the America's Cup as, as that defining moment that kind of we're almost Fremantle's high point, and, uh, and, and it is. But I think you're right. We're never going to have, have that moment again. Um, but what's what we have to do, actually, is build on a broad array of strengths, um, and I think it's what this report highlights, that are much more enduring than winning a large sporting event. I mean, that, that event changed Fremantle for forever and for the better. Um, and what we need to do now, though, is... is we always have, so keep our... I mean, what I like that comes out of this is that, that idea of keeping ourselves as a unique city that builds on its, it, it, it's a range of, of heritages and histories um, and, and defines a very bespoke, distinctive path going forward and doesn't just lose itself amongst a more generic Greater Perth going forward. Yeah, I mean, I would, agree, I would agree, Michael. I think, it, I mean, it was a defining part of Fremantle's recent history, wasn't it? But you can't trade on it forever. Um, and, and it certainly injected an enormous amount of capital and, and um, contributed to a, a, an amazing change, I suppose, in urban form and redevelopment and so on. Um, but so did the gold rush. Uh, and so I think, you know, really the future for Fremantle is to start thinking a little bit about um, the other things that are at its disposal. So that created, a, 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 I suppose, a framework upon which Fremantle can build, but it has, you know, as Marion pointed out, a significant knowledge economy that's emerging. It's got great uh, tourism and cultural assets and so on. So I think it's part of your story, but it, you know the extent to which you can trade on it for much longer, I think those days are behind you. One of the things that I see in my research of other cities is there's nothing like having the world on your doorstep to get your house in order. The <coughs> residents really get quite grumpy about that because, well, why can't you have done this before? So I think you know the report's out now and the challenge is to do good things for your community and then others will come too. John? It's a good segue, isn't it, uh, about the America's Cup. Sorry about screwing <laughs> up and losing it. Uh, we really stuffed up and we should have kept it another three years. Uh, I publicly apologise and grovel. <laughs> uh, look, I'd just like to cut to the last slide, it, which is the opportunities one, and you had it up there with all the opportunities. And I saw that the three one in the biggest font was uh, retail, uh, transport and culture, and I guess I'm standing here as the as the chair chair of Experience Perth, which is the Perth Regional Tourism Organisation that's responsible for the uh, tourism marketing of the uh, the whole of the Perth region and the drive market around it. And uh, it was interesting to see that tourism was a much smaller font, but retail was right up there. And I know I'm going to offend a whole lot of people by saying this, but I'll carry on and offend them. Um, I remember years ago when I was uh, running the Fremantle Chamber of Commerce as the CEO of the Fremantle Chamber of Commerce, a, um, uh, the mayor of, I think it was Mobile or somewhere, Memphis was it, um, in, um, in uh, America had come over here to uh, meet with Austal Ships because they were about to do a, um, a joint venture with Austal Ships to build naval vessels in America because America had lost its shipbuilding industry and didn't know how to build ships anymore, isn't that sad? Um, but uh, I was speaking to him, and he was also travelling with his CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. And I'd only just started in the Chamber of Commerce. I had to have a clue what I was doing. Uh, didn't actually know what I was doing eight years later, but still. Um, so I said to the... Uh, I had a coffee with the CEO, and I said, yeah, 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 but what do you do about retail? He said, retail? Retail? We don't bother about retail. Retail is what grows on successful economy. You've got to get your manufacturing and all of those things right first. Retail will come along. But when you listen to the program on the, on the radio this morning, people continually and talk about free. I say, oh, it's terrible. You know, the, the shops are, are closed and whatever, as if retail is the measure of the success of the place. 
I think a measure of the success of the place is that, is that we're now seen as the seventh best city in the world to visit next year. And tourism, in your slide, is seen in a little tiny font. Honestly, I think you've missed that. Thank you. Well, I'll defend our graphic artist there. I don't think that this steering committee thought that anything was one priority over another. All of them need to work in concert, so it's a visual um, abnormality, not anything else. Um, John, I think that some of your comments are very relevant, and as you know, I've been, and Graham will test be testament to this, that I've actually been a, um, a very strong advocate of developing a creative economy in the city of Fremantle for a very long period of time. What I would point out is, and you would be um, very aware of this, is that the offering of Fremantle as a whole is far beyond any individual element. The offering that Fremantle provides to international, domestic and local visitors extends far beyond retail, far beyond tourism. It's around our heritage, our amenity, the port, uh, retail festivals, Fremantle Arts Centre, Bathers Beach, Fisherman's Harbour. Fremantle is actually a package deal. Um, and as I have um, explained earlier today, when we actually address the grassroots issues around um, our workforce and our residents living in Fremantle, then absolutely retail will be absolutely booming because there will be that baseload population to support that industry as well as um, a myriad of other opportunities that have been flagged in this report. I think there's one other point to make about the data that are in the report as well. So one of the pieces of analysis that we do is on the sectors that are propulsive or that drive the economy forward and the tourism sectors are clearly uh, one of the most significant in terms of driving further jobs and further growth and so on. So they're certainly not sitting behind a number of others, they're, they're very significant in terms of generating additional jobs, uh, employment multipliers and so on. So that, that's pretty clear in the data. Fantastic. Victoria? Simone. Thanks, uh, Simone McGurk. I'm the state member uh, for Fremantle and I'm conscious that there's a lot of competition uh, to the state government's um, attention when you look at all those other metropolitan centres uh, that the graphic um, very was very clear from the graphic that you put up, Marion. Um, how do we get investment and attention by the state government into Fremantle? Uh, and it really, this question really follows on from John and Ra's previous comments that really we need, um, we need people working, we need people living and working here to build on all those pluses that Fremantle have. Um, I'm not trying to reduce this report down to one issue, but I am trying to think of the practicalities out of this and it is pretty hard to get around King Square and the sort of investment that we need um, and, the, for instance, the government has promised to relocate a department here but hasn't said that they're going to go ahead with it and hasn't said that they're not going to go ahead with it. I think that's hugely problematic for us. Anyway, I just wanted to know uh, what people on the panel would say about how we get state government attention to what is clearly uh, a very good offering down here in Fremantle but there is a lot um, vying for that attention. Well, it's obviously been extremely difficult. I think, you know, since the 70s, Fremantle's been in, you know, a political kind of decline and its urban structure, in a sense, been a bit dismantled, I think, by some of those. And, I mean, in the last, I think, four or five years until now, you've most recently seen eight, nine hundred million dollars of government funds go into the CBD of Perth and nothing here. Obviously, it's about making sure that Fremantle's ready to accept it. I think they are ready to accept it and making a lot of noise about it. I, we can't obviously wait for the government to solve the problem. The, you know, the concept about this report is actually to find out where we are and now with the community put together a plan and a vision for 20 years and with milestones that we can measure to ensure we, we, we all have to move <coughs> forward. And I think once we're ready, which I, you know, next year's the, the time to put that together, but. All of you are the only ones who are obviously going to slowly convince the government. The government have been told by the council, I think, for decades now, um, and told by lots of people who love Fremantle that it needs some help. 
and it hasn't received any at attention at all. And it's obviously, it seems like they work against it in many instances. <laughs> Come on, Brad. I mean, it, it's a, it is a key question, and I mean, to, of course, you know, to say it, I mean, part of our problem is that we are a very safe ALPC, and that's, I mean, and you um, think both sides of politics, we acknowledge we're not going to get the attention that a marginal seat's going to get. So what we're going to have to do, and this is why this is important, is make the empirical case, based on the evidence, as to why this has to happen. And it's going to then, to put it back on the state, be it either side of government, it was about leadership. It just says that, do you care about per, uh, Fremantle as per second city and are you actually going to, despite the fact you don't need the votes, going to actually make those investment decisions that, that this place needs? Um, and I think there's some really good evidence in here that says that the council can't do this alone. Um, we're going to need the help of everyone in this room, but ultimately we're also going to need to partner with the state because some of these big key investment decisions that can realign Fremantle going forward are going to actually are going to, can only happen across all of those levels. I would actually continue that by saying um, inversely to the America's Cup where the investment originated with the federal government and then was picked up by private investors. The City of Fremantle and the Fremantle Chamber of Commerce have worked very, very hard in encouraging private investment within the city in recent years. We now see a few cranes on the skyline. We now see some properties being um, refurbished and redeveloped in line with their um, heritage amenity in many instances, which is fantastic. And I'd like to think that um, now we have that sort of momentum, the state government will actually listen not just to local government and to um, the Chamber of Commerce, but also realise that there is a willingness to invest in the city of Fremantle now and take that, along with the changing demographic of the city, as a really big cue to start looking at how we can refocus the political agenda on the city. And I spend a lot of my time advocating with government the fact that you've got a report, and this plays very much to the strength of the Premier, he's a facts and figures kind of guy, but you have to have a strong narrative where all of you are singing from the same hymn sheet because politically, if a minister hears one thing and he goes and talks to his counterpart and hears something else, then straight away it's like, oh, Fred, Fremantle don't know what they want, so we'll just park them and we'll get on to somewhere else that does know what they want. And as I said, you've got so many different centres across Perth who are incredibly sophisticated in telling a very strong, compelling story that is consistent. I fully support that comment. I think we are too divided. But I want to talk about uh, Victoria Keys. I think we've got all the assets that uh, the Rocks have got, South Bank and everyone's got, We've got to get connectivity and, you know, if we actually put a casino at Victoria Keys, heaven forbid, we might get the next stadium as well from state government. But, um, you know, I think that's an asset that we've overlooked. It's just so unique and so... Uh, it's Elizabeth Keys, it's everything wrapped up in one. What is the committee doing uh, or progress with that? Um, do we get a redevelopment authority? But we've got to get something down there to really get this connectivity back onto that water. Uh, we've done it now at Bathers Beach and that's a real credit to Council for knocking that bit of sand hill down and getting that... But Victoria Keys is our next big asset that we've got to get into. Everyone look at me again. Um, <laughs> I mean, it is, Jared, you're right. Um, extraordinary opportunity, I think, in terms of connecting with it, with our, with our waterfront. Um, and I mean, there's a big question mark around how. We, and this actually comes back <laughs> comes back to tourism and what John Longley was saying before. I mean, we've got over 50 passenger ships coming this year. And we actually need, and I think one of the things that we need to do is invest in a good arrival point for, for so that we don't have that, that sense of passengers wandering aimlessly in, in up a hot path. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's, I, mean, I think everyone here cringes I'll be, I mean, when, when we see it. And I think there's a real opportunity there to actually to do that, to reconnect with the water where everyone wins. And, um, and I think some of the precinct plans we've seen around Victoria Key are a really good first step in that direction where we can start to do that. Um, and I guess there's a whole other issue which is touched on lightly in this report but I think is one that's probably on the scope of this in many ways is around obviously the future of the port, Perth Freight Link and all of those things which are probably a whole other discussion for another day. No, I support that. Obviously there's been plans of integrating Fremantle into the port for 23 or 4 or 5 years 
um, and nothing's happened in all those years. We were stupid enough to actually buy the e-shed and move it when they were going to get rid of it because they were going to instigate and implement all of those plans 20 years ago. Um, but it's very slow moving, but obviously it just needs, I think this, you know, we hope this is the start of actually putting pressure on government and all the authorities, the planning authorities, et cetera, that's why Eric's here today, to help us, um, to make sure all of these changes can happen because there's been a lot spoken about and very little done. And I think, you know, hanging your hat on, you know, what happened in America's Cup and hoping something else is gonna come along will never happen. You know, we've gotta do it, everyone in this room and everyone else. And it's about that philosophy as well. You've got 50 cruise ships coming in this year. It's more than the ones that were coming last year. It's a booming industry. The more people age, the more people are going to go on cruise ships. Um, and if they can get off in a destination and find where they need to go, um, you know, you, you keep them as your asset and they're spending in your community rather than going somewhere else. Thanks. Um, my question, I want to pick up on that issue of divisiveness and I guess my question is for the people from the Committee of Perth, the researchers and, and Marion. Um, I'm from Notre Dame. We are, according to some, we've enlivened the West End and then according to some we've killed the West End and ruined the entire Fremantle. Um, it's always been this sense of a divided community. Now, we all know that there's, there's um, a lot to be gained from, uh, not conflict, but from healthy discussion and differences of opinion. To what extent in your research and in doing this, would, do you believe that the level of divisiveness um, is greater or less than other places or much the same? And whether it can be a hindrance to things going forward, oh, I sound like a politician with respect to all the politicians in the room, but going forward, um, uh, what impact do you think that could have? Well, we didn't really take this on as, a, I suppose, a sociological study, so we didn't really look closely at social relations and political relations and so on. But it struck, it certainly struck me as I was looking over a lot of the material around uh, the work that we did that there was a lot of, lot of passion and really healthy debate around the city that you don't find in a lot of other places. And I thought that was, that was a really, really good sign because the level of apathy in many other urban centres is palpable, I suppose, in some respects, or not palpable. Um, and so I think that was a, that, that's a strength. I think it is worthwhile considering, though, the extent to which debate can lead to paralysis as well. So in, in other words, I suppose that you can end up with such entrenched positions that there can be no consensus or movement forward. So I think that's a really significant thing to, to give more thought to over the next 12 or 18 months. Um, and that's not to say you'll get consensus necessarily on every issue, I don't think, but I think it is to say that at some point decisions need to be made where not everybody will be comfortable with the outcome, but at least it sees the community continue to move forward. So I think, you know, there, there are potentially concerns around the degree to which that can lead to, uh, lead to paralysis, but um, I, I'm, I was sort of heartened in some respects by the degree of passion and commitment and sense of identity and sense of place around, around the city. Can I, just, I can, just, uh, can I just comment on the West End? Uh, in the report you will see that, uh, you know, we, we say that Notre Dame is a strength for the community as well as having a TAFE here. There are lots of cities around the world trying to invent themselves as university towns and you've got an asset here. It's about making it work for the community outside of the student hours is I think more what people talk about. And so that's how, the, how does the university integrate more and how does the city integrate more with the university? Uh, can I just can I just ask if you just state your name and, and absolutely your uh, I'm Rachel Pemberton I'm one of the councillors for the city of Fremantle and um, I found today's information really useful and interesting and I wanted to pick up particularly on the aspect around the population here in Fremantle and its relative size to Greater Perth and therefore the implications of that both economic and also socially and and our place as a regional um, centre, but also then the average house price and the fact that we want to attract more people to live here as well as work here and shop here, etc. Um, but we have this extraordinary barrier that our median house price is double that um, anywhere else in Perth. And in some ways it might be a question for Eric as much as anyone on the, um, the panel, but how do we try and overcome that and, and bring the new residents here 
while having an affordable price point without just making the housing tiny or stacking it up really high? I mean, housing affordability comes also through choice and diversity and also volume of housing you put into the marketplace. So I think there's lots of examples all over the world where, be it if it's council-owned land or government-owned land, they may say X percentage of that project will require housing in a certain price bracket, um, trying to assist and create opportunities for developers to make sure diversity is in their product range. Um, you know, there's lots of models, there's co-op models, there's a lot of models that actually can deliver further diversity. So it's really now that it's identified clearly that it's something that holds Fremantle back, it's something that should be acted on and that's obviously part of policy creation and implementation. But it's not complicated, it's very, very simple. There's about 3,000 different models to choose from. You know? I think the other thing that about your, the demographic uh, question is a rather interesting one. One of the things that we found was, I think it's uh, just a little over, around about 55% of the population move address within a five year period uh, between census dates typically. So you've got a very, very mobile population and every time of course somebody moves, they're making choices about where they might live and locate and so on. So I think that speaks to Adrian's point about diversity. Um, so in order to cater for that, that <coughs> churn and be able to uh, accommodate all of the different interests that are potentially seeking out your location. There obviously needs to be a range of different dwelling types, a range of different dwelling densities and so on. I don't think it's a one size fits all at all, but certainly diversity I think is a bit of a key message around housing in the report. I might also add that um, Fremantle is short of land. Obviously that horizontal community is not an option forever. But it's also worth considering things like the fact that the Department of Housing has a very healthy um, stock of land within what is a very small and um, expensive uh, area. So perhaps we also need to engage with the state government and look at ways of releasing that land, not just one bedroom, one bathroom um, apartments for people, but also um, accommodation that will, will suit um, families. Um, so, you know, that, th there's a whole lot of issues around um, that, that particular affordability thing as well and a lot of stakeholders to engage. But first of all, what are the assets you got here? This is what you call free trading. Um, <coughs> what are the assets you got here? You've got a huge waterfront which needs to be capitalised on and developed and across the synergies. And they've mentioned here about the cruise shipping and that is a change in the economic climate. Uh, there's a lot more changes with the cruise shipping to what it was 10, 15 years ago. And <coughs> that's a huge economic driver if managed appropriately with the that foreshore, but also linking it back with other tourism items around the Fisherman's Harbour and out here. The other point I'd make is that it is critical that you do have residential diversity. 30 years ago, the City of Perth had a policy of no residential development in the City of Perth. It killed the City of Perth for a long period of time. They opposed residential, they opposed the shopping centres going out of Perth City because they thought that that policy environment would save the city. It did not. The city was vacant after five. Look at a difference now in terms of not only residential development, but the diversity which it is now encouraging. And that's what you've got to do because your catchment area, in terms of localised, is limited, but your diversity is huge if you manage it correctly. And you need to bring people along in how you manage that. The other aspect is that <coughs> with that diversity and those type of developments, you will generate increasing tourism and tourism activities got plenty of things going here, points of difference, which other regional centres haven't got. And whilst Marion quite correctly talked about other regional centres competition, the point is you have to establish point of difference differences, not just one. And I think if that happens, then you will maximise your retail in different product forms, over and above what you've got now. And I think it is also critical <coughs> that for all these elements to come together and work together, because they actually cross boundaries of influence, if I could call it that, you need to bring the community on side and consensus. 
Now, this is where I'm going to be blunt. The City of Fremantle has not been consistent in its approach in the past, uh, other than recent times. In fact, it was diverse. You could not get a consensus of an approach. It might be OK here, but not there. You cannot deal with development of regional centres such as Fremantle in that fragmentation form. It does not work, regardless of which polit political party is in power. I've seen it. We had the same issue when I was at Swan with Midland until we had to say some very blunt messages, and I agree with the comment saying sometimes you've got to stop the spinning wheel of discussion and make a point of an approach, and you may refine it over time, but you've got to have a consistent um, moving forward and get that consensus as much as possible. You will never get 100%, I can guarantee you that, never, but you've really got to get a majority consensus of the approach, which is reasonable, and then pr proceed along. And I think there's major issues there, which if you address those effectively using this report as a basis, you will make a point of difference for Fremantle and then you'll put yourself back on the map. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Just one minor counter to that, um, in reality, from what you saw as the price of Fremantle, of medium price, is actually because of the action groups that fought the developers in reality. So what we love of Fremantle, what, you know, Garden City now does Resi to look like Frio, you know, Joondalup does to look like Frio, they're never going to be Frio. The reality of a, having a strong community that's proud of where they're living is actually what's given you a fantastic capital base. So that opinion, we don't want, I don't believe we, you want to stop the opinion. I as a developer have developed in Fremantle since the 80s never had a problem, didn't, doesn't matter who's the mayor, who's the councillors, who the officers are. If you do a good project, you usually get support. The community was protecting good projects. In the reality, in most other areas, if you do a bad project, you get it approved. If you do a good project, it's harder to get approved. And that's actually what happens in reality. So there's not many councils who play at the same level. So what I think we want, as a Fremantle community, is to ensure we still get great quality outcomes, but address the weaknesses that have developed due to our success of protecting what is Frio. And I think that's an important message for all of us. Okay. Thank you. I'm uh, Lynn McLaren. I'm the other Greens, uh, well, the other state member who is uh, with the Greens. And I just wanted to pick up on what Eric Lumsden said about consensus, because the Greens know something about consensus. And uh, it's no mistake that the Greens' um, heartland is in and around Fremantle. You know, it is the community that has built the Greens is the Fremantle community. And the, the way that we got there was the discourse. We had to have a lot of discourse. We had to have a lot of debate. We had to have a lot of discussion around how to build consensus. You can't impose consensus from any other place other than us choosing it and hearing each other and hearing each other's different views. So I think this is an amazingly powerful and positive report that we have now to work with. It is the first report you know, in recent times that really focuses on the people in Fremantle and what we want to develop in Fremantle. And if we start focusing on the positives, and I think one of the reasons why we think there's division and divisiveness is because we have a local newspaper. That is rare in Perth. Mm. You know, all throughout the metropolitan area, no one has something like the Herald, you know, it, unless you've got the voice. The voice and the Herald are really community voices that air our different opinions. But that doesn't mean here. that there's inherently um, you know, more div division here than there is anywhere else. It just means that we have a place for it to read it yeah. and, to, and to learn about it. So I think, you know, it's a, I don't know, is the Herald here today? Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a mistake. I think the Herald needs to be here. I, I don't believe we have a representative from the Fremantle Society either, which is disappointing. Yeah, and you can't make people come to lunch. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, you know, it is very, it is, it is the beginning point. And I think it's a very positive and, and, and exciting, uh, you know, uh, process that you're taking us on. And uh, I want to do everything I can to keep it moving and to, to bring that positive views about what do we have in common? What are our common views? What are, what are our common Fremantle values? And then, yes, we can deal with the differences. We can deal with, you know, whether we want high-rise here or high-rise there. 
But we need to uh, also, I, you know, I guess first talk, come from a position of we love Fremantle. We all mm -hmm. love it, and we want to keep it, and we want it to um, enhance its character, not not lose its character or diminish its character. And I think that beginning by accepting that we have limits, we have limits in Fremantle, we have limited land, you know, is, is a good starting point. We shouldn't be comparing ourselves with the greater metropolitan area, which has just, you know, cleared land and developed out and grown and grown and grown, and especially in my region down in Rockingham, one of the biggest, you know, Warren Bros, and it's one of the biggest growing areas, because they're, you know, knocking down bush. And we don't have that problem in Fremantle. So let's not make it a problem. Let's not identify it as a problem. We might have a limit in how many people can live here. You know, that's okay. Yeah. It's not a bad thing. <laughs> and um, we want to make sure that, you know, we maybe don't have a limit on the people who come here for tourism, for example. So let's um, talk about the common goals that we have. Keep it moving forward. I commend you. I loved your presentation, Marion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, I'm Brian Smith, and I guess I'd like to begin by thanking Marion because she took a punt on a bunch of us who asked her to come and work on this project a couple of years ago, and uh, I think the proof of the proverbial pudding is in the eating. I can't echo more the concept that we now have a fact base that we can talk from and that it is up to us as a community to exploit that in the melt most effective way we can and recognize that none of us are going to get everything we want when that happens. It's a matter of compromising all the way through and recognizing that the folks in this room who sign checks do it because they anticipate a reasonable return for their investment and to pretend otherwise is whistling by the graveyard. And finally I'd like to say as someone who was in Montreal when the Olympics were there the one thing that Montrealers still have as a result of the Olympics is they're paying off the debt. We're lucky Fremantle doesn't have that. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Vic, I think we're just over here. The federal government or the Department of Defence are about to sell Lewin Barracks. And we talk about not having much land around here. There's 14 hectares there that's... Um, about to be sold and it's adjacent to the most utilised piece of river foreshore in the metropolitan area. So we've got an opportunity to do something really special there or we can follow the Department of Defence's um, mode of operation and flog it in a, in a fire sale. Uh, what um, messages would the committee have for the three tiers of government in making the best of that opportunity? Adrian? Oh. Obviously, I, I don't know what process they're going through and I don't know what the council has done to design a fantastic outcome for that piece of land and what suggestions the community has put forward to the defence housing. I'm sure they're open to it. Um, I'm sure they don't want the lowest price, they most really want the best price. And I, you know, it's, it's really up to the council also to actually motivate them on a great outcome. I, I assume the land person who wins the site at the end of the day has got to go and get a DA. I, I assume they're not doing it under federal legislation like an airport. So really it's about the council being proactive and identifying what is that opportunity. Um, you know, there's lots of examples of mixed use, et cetera, and green belts running through the middle of it, so it connects maybe even better than it does to your community than it does now. It's obviously fenced off. And I don't think, I wouldn't be worried about the massive use of the foreshore, because I've seen a lot more dense places with pedestrians in my life. Um, and I'm sure Cop Beach has got a lot more issues. So I don't think it's a, a public space issue. It's about what's a great plan for the, for the land and feed that out there. And then the developers would be excited to see it also, I'm sure, you know? Thanks, Adrian. Hold the back here. Yeah, Adrian, <coughs> I think... Um, Sorry, could you just state your name and... Yeah, my name's Howard Putty. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think Thanks. my question's probably directed to um, uh, Mr. Simpson. I think was um, he'd asked the question earlier. Um, <coughs> just I'm following on from the last question, Adrian. In terms of uh, Lewin, wouldn't it have been uh, 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 an idea for the federal government to have put in plan some sort of a plan to over that site originally? It'd be a great idea, yep. but the, well, they're usually in charge of driving, you know, equipment instead of doing drawings. Defence Housing or Defence <laughs> Department. Yeah. I don't think they've got a planning arm. Or, I'm not sure, but yeah, yeah, you'd assume they would have done some studies to maximise value, but or they would have appointed real estate agents to do that. I've got no, I've got no idea of the process. Yeah. But if there isn't one out there, if I was on the council, I'd be working goddamn hard getting a great plan together. Yeah. <laughs> Because well, you're going to have to <coughs> address it anyway. Or the community well, what, what address about them. a bit closer to home then? What about the uh, Henderson Street Police Barracks, which is a, a state government bit of land that's being sold off? Mm. Again, surely, surely some sort of um, plan over that would have would have helped people put together a, a DA. Yeah. yeah, in fact, that's another key bit of real estate, both the Waters Cottages, which are obviously going mm. to um, the State Heritage Offices um, and Heritage Council are doing some work on those at the moment, but of course adjacent to that is the old police complex. Um, and there's an extraordinary potential for doing something which I think actually could, like Lewin, actually it's about that connectivity and those things that you yeah. can, those really great outcomes you can get with good planning. I would say that Lewin's very relevant to this because this report is not just about Fremantle Council and Fremantle, but mm. East Fremantle is very in integral to this um, and actually enables planning and thinking around those broader areas as well. But what those questions illustrate is that there is an extraordinary amount of both state and federal government assets that are underutilised and really mean that free, I mean, in, in terms of what Fremantle can achieve, it's going to need those assets being, being realised and those, that potential being, being, being realised because it's really, they're really exciting things, but they also can be, could be terrible if you get them wrong, but could be extraordinarily good for both of our communities if we get them right. And I guess um, I couldn't agree more, especially on, on, on the police one. Um, I, I think you get that right and you've all of a sudden got a fantastic connection between the town hall and our world heritage asset of Fremantle Prison and all, all those things can start to happen and I think there's a great opportunity there and I look forward to seeing those plans when we finally get to them. Great. Thanks, Brad. Uh, we've got enough time for maybe one or two more questions, so. Hi, I'm Mick McCarthy from the South West Group. Uh, firstly, um, commendations for putting together the report. I haven't read it, but obviously the presentation was very good and um, it's quite an exciting time. I think Frio's at the cusp of um, uh, moving towards a new direction and I think this is a great informing document to help them with that. They've also got this document too, which is the Economic Development Strategy, and I think um, people should have a read of this because this is um, a, a quite an important document in shaping the future of Fremantle and it actually aligns all the um, uh, council's uh, areas of work, capital works, planning, uh, infrastructure development, all together in towards an economic outcome, which is a hard thing to do and it's, it's quite a, uh, a good document for a guiding thing. My question is, um, if that's the plan you're working through, and we've heard a lot about connectivity and the need to get on with development to create connectivity between Victoria Harbour, uh, King Square uh, and other areas. Is there something that came out of this process that's additional to that or provided more emphasis on the economic development strategy to say, yeah, we need to tweak it this way or we need to do this or this is a new thing that we need to, to, um, uh, to put on the, uh, on the table to uh, champion as, a, as a, a priority? One of the things that we did quite a bit of work on, and it finds it finds some voice in the report. There's at least a couple of uh, couple of pages on this. Is the issue of local competitiveness around your uh, around your economy? And one of the things that we found was that um, that you've got a number of areas where you're very specialised in doing extremely well. You, you have the potential to do extremely well in. So they're propulsive sectors that generate lots of additional employment and so on. But in fact, they're growing much slower than they should have. They're even in decline. Um, and most of that comes down to various forms of local competitive constraints. Now, we don't pinpoint exactly what they are, but they can include things like mm. land availability and cost. They could include infrastructure more generally. They could include 
local government uh, regulation and, and, uh, and planning controls and so on. They could include the degree of governance and regulation that is sort of joined up, if you like. So there are a range of competitive constraints that are somehow holding back the, uh, the economy. And it actually speaks quite well to the, to the strategy document in some respects. So I think one of the important things is to start, is to start looking into what are those competitive constraints that are holding back, um, uh, that are holding back those various sectors that are, that are really quite crucial uh, to your economy into the medium term. So these are not things that are necessarily holding you back because of state government regulations or, or, or things that are going on in the global economy. They are very local factors and there needs to be a bit more work on exactly what those, those factors are. I think a lot of it leads to what are you know, the next steps from this report. So as we mentioned, it's about having forums in the first quarter of next year. And this is kind of to start what are the topics we're going to be discussing and you know, across housing, the economy, you know, the creation of small business and how do we stimulate that because that's the only thing that's going to employ people. Identifying the tourism, heritage and cultural areas of how we can grow that and strengthen that. I think some of that, call it the public space and urbanality about it. Um, and then I think what we've got to do is make sure we get a lot more youth in the forums and make sure we've got, you know, ask our kids what's wrong with Freeman and what's right and how do we set that. So it's about getting all those opinions to kind of put a plan together and then start making a list of priorities that create change. We actually have to get change happening in Fremantle and make sure we're looking at a, you know, a different place or an improving place over the next five years and have a, you know, a good vision for the whole of Frio. Now I treat this as a baseline report. Mm. So fact base as, as a broader project its subtitle that Matthew and I don't print anywhere is basically dispelling the myth and folklore. And when you've got a whole lot of people signed up to conventional wisdoms that may or may not be true, there's nothing like having the baseline data report to go back to and actually test the theory. So now you've got this you know, sort of knowledge base on which to draw from. You can have a more informed conversation, which I think will bring some cohesive conversation in. And, um, you know, the fact that you've got so much opportunity. Like I said, it quite surprised me. I was really pleased that we weren't going to come back after 12 months of hard work and say to you, we can't see anything here for you. Mm. You've just got so much opportunity. Okay, last question, Bruce. Uh, Bruce Moriarty, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I guess a question for Marion. Um, a lot of the statistics and data is based on the 2011, and you'll know when the ink will be wet on the 2016 statistics. Is there any provision for us to go back and review those in a formal sense, just to compare what we, you've created here and what we're likely to see. And I think we will see some positive changes, but I'd just like to think there was provision for that. Uh, there hasn't been provision made, so we've delivered the project over and above scope, in my view, as the project director. Um, but the, it takes about 12 months, Matthew, for the yeah, census it, data. I think um, all of the data are comparable across time, uh, unless there are any changes to ABS, some, some of the categories and so on. So basically there'd be no reason that in due course somebody couldn't go back and simply compare how you've tracked against the things that we've done, including some of the analytical techniques. So some of the data we've gone and done other things with and, and, um, and tried to make it, <coughs> create a bit more value around it, you'll be able to go back and, and see how you've performed over time. And you know some of the data we've got going right back to the 1940s, we can pick the story up in the 70s and you can really look at how things have changed over time quite easily. Yeah. Righty-ho, okay then, I think I'll um, wrap it up there. Uh, uh, personally, this has been, I don't know, going on for, I don't know, three, four years now, hasn't it, Marion, since, it, since we sort of started off the, uh, started off the discussion on this. And I, I'm, I'm absolutely um, enlightened by uh, having, having this baseline document uh, that actually gives us uh, the ability to be able to drive where Fremantle goes in the future and actually sets out a bit of a, bit of a roadmap there for us to, for what we need to work on. So uh, there's, been a, there's been a lot of people come in here and, uh, you know, Marion getting all the troops... Uh, getting all the troops together and Adrian as chair, um, all the stakeholders, Brad, and um, coming through. But uh, th there's been many people in here, but there's, uh, there's a few people actually put their hand in their pocket to make this happen. So uh, I'd like to thank those people. Um, so the University of Western Australia, the City of Fremantle, the City of East Fremantle, Fremantle Ports, University of Notre Dame, Coda Studio, MMA Offshore, Serona Capital, Match, and Fremantle Chamber of Commerce. So. Uh, I think, I think it's been a great discussion today and thank you so much for uh, all the work. Uh, we really appreciate it. Cheers.